So the topic I want to cover today is fairly complex, and it will almost certainly take a while. I'm not known for my brevity. Number one and two, it is, as I said, reasonably complicated. And what I want to get into ultimately is why we find this, number one, sense of apathy in the European popula population, uh, at least active apathy, as opposed to passive apathy, which I'll get into later, uh, towards effectively the Islamification of Europe or Islam in more, uh, more generally. Um, and also the Muhammad's, uh, Mohammedans uh, reluctance to assimilate and sort of give up their own religion. But in order to get there, we have to go through a lot of history uh, and a lot of interpretation. Now, for better or worse, this will be effectively my opinion, uh, because history is, in some sense, opinion. Interpretation is part of history. You can have uh, an event such as the conquest, the final conquest of Constantinople in 1453. Uh, we know that's when it happened, but all the details, well, that is oftentimes a matter of interpretation, depending on the context and the event. And so I have to do the same here. So I'm going to begin with a general trajectory of religious belief and how things start. And then I'm going to move from there and move forward to um, polytheism within the Roman Empire as well as the emergence of monotheism uh, in the Middle East and then uh, go forward from there. So uh, the most common form of religion uh, prehistorically was essentially a type of shamanism or, or more properly called animism. Um, various spirits and what have you inhabiting rocks and ponds and streams and and what have you. And uh, this was maintained for a very uh, long time. Of course, it had advanced in various forms, and it's to be found, obviously, in Native American cultures, in Central Asian cultures, Eastern uh, cultures, and in the earlier uh, cultures, um, the precursors to Indo-European culture. And there seems to be a general evolution or trajectory. I say general because it's not absolute and it's not universal, so general trajectory of animism moving forward and uh, thereby transforming into something else, nominally polytheism, or I suppose you could call it the anthropomorphication uh, of, of these spirits, the association of these spirits as actual entities uh, that one could recognize as somewhat human, although, of course, far more powerful. And polytheism, of course, is uh, uh, quite a common uh, phenomenon. It, it was found in the Middle East. It was found in uh, Indo-European cultures and to various uh, degrees um, outside of those um, geographical areas, although uh, it should be noted that animism uh, and various shamanistic traditions related to it uh, has persisted in areas outside of the Middle East and Europe for far longer. Um, the native religion of uh, Japan and uh, Korea is one such example. So uh, we get polytheism, and polytheism is kind of a, I guess, a go-to or a staple for quite some uh, time. Now, the thing about polytheism is that, generally speaking, it tends to be uh, more tolerant uh, of differences between uh, religion. Generally speaking, this isn't uniform. I'll get in, once again, with reference to the Roman Empire, which I'm about to talk about soon. Uh, there are some exceptions, but, and this is, of course, uh, part of the essential hardware of polytheism. If you have a religion with many gods and deities in it, um, one would almost assume naturally, that one would be more partial to the possibility of, of other gods, if only to acknowledge that perhaps this god is an interpretation of my god or what have you. There's a kind of uh, back and forth, for example, between the Greek pantheon and the Roman uh, pantheon. They're not identical, but um, it's almost certain that um, many gods in the Roman uh, pantheon could readily be uh, associated almost interchangeably. And th this is oftentimes by design, if you look at Roman history, with the Greek uh, pantheon or mythology. So you know, Mars, the, the god of war, and Ares. 
just as an example, uh, Artemis and Diana, and, and so on and so forth. The list goes on and on, uh, Jupiter, Zeus. Um, of course, in many cases, uh, etymologically not always direct, but um, many of these deities share a, um, a common Indo-European origin. In fact, Zeus is uh, a derivative of, of the original word uh, for uh, God in uh, Proto-Indo-European, and the Latin word Deus is a derivative of that, which just means it's not a specific God, but a God. So, yes, this is um, something that, that happens quite often. But of course, as I said, there, there is a, a willingness to accept these things and say, well, this is a version of my God or, or what have you. Um, there's also uh, the aspect of multiple roles, um, which is to say, whilst uh, Apollo might be the God of the sun, um, we know that Poseidon is the God of the sea or in this case, you know, Neptune and, and Apollo. So, uh, in the case of Rome, they have their roles and their assigned roles. And within the context of polytheism, um, there is also very commonly, not universally, but the ph phenomenon of uh, henotheism. Now, henotheism is, is a confusing term to many. Um, it, it originally comes from the Greek word uh, henis, or hena in some cases, so meaning one or single. And it refers to the primary uh, worship of a specific deity whilst acknowledging the existence of others and not necessarily excluding the others, which is to say, um, maybe you are a Roman, that per a soldier that prefers the worship of Mars, but acknowledges the, obviously, the importance of the ruler of the gods, Jupiter, um, of, of other gods, such as uh, Bacchus, um, and what have you, uh, the god of revelry. Uh, they are there, and maybe even you pay occasional homage to them, but you prioritize um, the worship of Mars in this case. But that would be a case of henotheism, um, from the Greek word uh, henis or hena, depending on the context, referring to one or the only. Now, there's a, and, and you see this also uh, in, in quite extreme forms in, in, in the Egyptian uh, pantheon uh, towards well, as, as, as the Egyptian religion and civilization develops, where um, the, the sun god, Ra, is, generally speaking, t takes on a, a sort of henotheistic position. Um, and this, too, could be observed as a, as a kind of religious evolution or trajectory that many religions uh, uh, follow. Not all, obviously, and it's not universal, but it's something that is uh, trendy enough in the history of religion, particularly in the West and the Middle East, that, that it, it holds some, it's, uh, it's tenable as a position to describe how things go, go with religion. So we get a kind of uh, henotheism. Now, then you might be thinking, well, from henotheism, we, um, we're going to get monotheism. Not quite so. From henotheism, we get something that is sort of arcanely referred to. It's only, I guess, used by religious scholars and people and weirdos like me who have an interest in this stuff. Monolatrism. Now, mon mono uh, comes from monos, uh, meaning single in Greek, and uh, latreia is, means worship. So monolatrism is the worship of a single god. This is distinct from monotheism. Now, the distinction between these three things I'll get into uh, right now. Henotheism uh, prioritizes the worship of one uh, god or deity amongst many. That is, there it is acknowledged that there are other gods, such as was the case in ancient Greece and ancient Rome, uh, as well as uh, the Germanic cultures. Um, you could uh, see, depending on the period of time, the Germanic cultures, uh, Woden or uh, Odin, or Odin as we call him in modern English, although that's ultimately a derivative of Norse mythology, and the proper English term would be Woden, um, he had a, an authoritative or a primary uh, position in that pantheon, uh, but obviously there are uh, other gods, Thor, his son, alleged son, um, uh, Baldur, and, and others. So it's this is not unusual. This is very common. So that's sort of polytheism 
and I think henotheism is quite common. When you try, but you don't transition from henotheism directly to monotheism, and there are reasons for this because monolatrism is the intermediary stage between the henotheistic and the monotheistic, that being the worship of a single god. Now, what the monolatrist does, as opposed to the henotheist or the monotheist, is that he will acknowledge that there are other gods, and we're going to get into this in a bit with regards to the Bible and, and the Hebrew religion. Uh, he will acknowledge that there are other gods, but uh, he will proclaim not only uh, the importance of the worship of his deity, but the importance of the worship of his deity to the exclusion of those other gods, all the while acknowledge, acknowledging uh, their uh, existence. And uh, Which is to say, there is... There are other, other gods, but they are not worthy of equal worship. And mono, the monolatrous position, incidentally, is very well represented in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, where you see, it's, on, it's almost a certitude, I would say, um, knowing what we know uh, about the, the Bible, that the, the quote-unquote jealous God of the Bible openly acknowledges the existence of other Canaanite deities. And I think uh, many scholars would agree that uh, the God of the Bible probably uh, was originally some local store, uh, Canaanite storm or, or war god. Um, w- whence comes the term, I am a jealous God? He acknowledges the existence of these other deities, but asserts his own dominance, asserts his, uh, the, the prioritization of his own worship uh, compared to theirs, uh, theirs, as well as the exclusivity of his worship. So we can see that this is also generally a trend you see in religion, that you move from animism to polytheism to henotheism to, to monolatrism as represented in, in, in the Old Testament, and eventually we'll get, uh, we get to uh, monotheism. All the while, there are other things going on here. Um, now, I want to just point out that these transitions, I, in my own interpretation of what's going on here historically, religiously, are not in uh, transitions based on people's thoughts on reality, which is to say they're not uh, contemplating the nature of reality and saying, aha, the, you know, henotheism is a more accurate representation of reality. Well, that's effectively still polytheism or monolatrism even. Um, nor is monotheism a manifestation of a, a, much, a much more accurate picture of, of reality. Um, if anything, polytheism makes more sense um, in that everyone has a role. It's much more reflective of the way we understand things as humans. But uh, what I'm going to argue here is that the development from polytheism to henotheism to monolatrism and then to monotheism is a development of authoritarianism and chosenness, the uh, the electi or, or uh, electus, the singular, the chosen. In Greek, it would be eklektos, eklektoi in the plural. Um, this is something we manifestly see in the Bible and the, the thing, well, the Hebrew Bible. And uh, I would argue is probably the, the cultural beginnings of uh, the sort of insular neuroticism that is so common uh, amongst Jews. Uh, I am take, handling this video from a cultural historical perspective. There's no doubt that there are always genetic elements in the development of culture. There's a genetic component to everything, but I'm taking primarily cultural. But if you look at the transition from uh, henotheism to, uh, to, to monolatrism, um, presumably is what happened in, in that part of the world, um, it's undeniable that there's an authoritarian aspect there, one and two, that the notion of being chosen uh, is another element of that. And this is very important as we understand, uh, try to understand the development of Christianity and subsequently Islam and, and, and just the course of events in, in Europe in recent years and what have you. And so, yes, the uh, notion of chosenness, which uh, I wouldn't say they came up with, but they certainly uh, had a, a good sales pitch, uh, the Jews back then. And... Uh, Within this chosenness, you have, a, as differentiated from Christianity and later Islam, uh, a very insular uh, culture, a religious culture, um, and uh, pretty exclusive as well. 
and eventually you get a kind of uh, basically monotheism. The monolatrism is forgotten, and you end up with monotheism, which is the outright denial of the existence of other gods. And of course, uh, thereby the centralization of the authority of that one uh, deity. Now, if for all intents and purposes, with regards to the three so-called great monotheisms, uh, the Jews at the time came up with uh, their own sort of insular, nutty uh, monotheism, the uh, and the you move from uh, Judaism to or Judaism to Christianity, there are changes. But I want you to bear in mind that there's something that uh, that remains constant, I think, throughout the development of all these religions. Now, it is true that uh, the Jews call themselves the chosen people, and you know this is they'll claim that this doesn't mean certain things, and other people will claim it regardless. But the sense of chosenness, I think, is something that is retained uh, in Christianity and in Islam, but in a different sense. And I'll get into that in a bit. So that this is something that's important that needs to be borne in mind, as well as authoritarianism. Um, monolatrism is the first transition to a kind of, a kind of political religious authoritarianism. Monotheism is, I guess, the final one. And you see this by uh, dint of the issues the Romans had with the Jews at the time. Um, it's more complicated than just saying, well, they wouldn't... Uh, they wouldn't submit to the worship of the Roman gods. Um, and, and certainly in the time of uh, the Roman Empire, by then there was that full transition from monolatrism to monotheism. And so there's no way that the Jews at the time would have worshipped uh, one of the Roman gods or recognized the in later years the emperor as some sort of uh, divine, divine being. Um, and the Romans had to make their peace with that for political reasons. They didn't want revolt. They had to deal with a couple of revolts and they had at some point in time uh, engaged in deals uh, with the, the Jews at the time. So they had to sort of accept that. Uh, all, and once again, you see the continuity of this notion of chosenness there, the Jewish insularity and, uh, and uh, well, like I said, that probably the the, cont the beginnings and continuity of, of that kind of neuroticism uh, that, that's so common that would later lead to uh, many problems uh, historically down the line for uh, that group of people. But then we move forward and we get Christianity. Now, Christianity, of course, is, uh, is in some sense an amalgam of the Indo-European and the Semitic. Uh, the, it's almost undeniable that Christianity took some uh, input from sort of mystery religions. Uh, I mean, there are scholars who claim that's not true. That's sort of the dying, rising gods. There are other ones. Um, and, and so, because everything is sort of miscegenated, religiously speaking, at the time. It's a lot of mixture. But, of course, there's also the legacy of Judaism. And what Christianity does is it, it, it it's, a, it's a twist on everything. Not only do you have the mythical figure of, of Christ, the Savior, um, but... Effectively, what Christ is doing is that he's universalizing chosenness, which is to say, if you bow do down and worship um, this particular uh, you know, this particular God, this very strange <laughs> um, trinity, as it's presented to us, then you become part of the chosen. And it's a much simpler uh, entry form as it, or for, uh, that you have to fill in, effectively. It's not... I mean, yes, one could have and could convert to Judaism to become one of the quote-unquote chosen, but with Christianity, you merely need to accept this Jesus figure as your Lord and Savior. But nonetheless, the notion of being chosen, even though they don't call it that, persists. And because of that, you also have, once Christianity is accepted um, by Constantine, who rather famously claimed that he had seen the the symbol of Christ in, in the sky. I'm trying to remember the Latin he claimed to have uh, he said. In, in hoc signo vinces. So in this symbol you will conquer. It's obviously propaganda, propagandist nonsense, but still. Um, obviously it was meek to begin with, but 
The seeds of authoritarianism, what I'm arguing here, have always been present in monolatrism as well as monotheism, and it grows in time. The Roman Empire finally assumes Christianity as its primary religion, Council of Nicaea, yada, yada, yada. Um, but the difference here being that Christianity, by its very nature, by its more accepting nature, it's the universality of its chosenness, right, uh, lends itself to proselytizing and, of course, converting. And, of course, a greater sense of intolerance. You could argue that earlier incarnations, Judaism simply wanted to be left alone for the most part. Um, insular, exclusive, doing their own thing. Um, you could even argue for that in the case of religious Jews later on in these so-called shtetls in, um, in Eastern Europe. But that's neither here nor there. But Christianity had a, you know, a different angle. So chosen, yes, but you, know, I mean, you can all be chosen. You just need to accept Christ. The problem with monotheism is that monotheism, by its very nature, has to, to some degree be intolerant of other religions, in particular, and, and other gods, because by its very nature, well, you can't acknowledge other gods if you're going to insist and persist in your monotheistic beliefs. And so Christianity, of course, is, uh, is kind of a step away from Judaism. That it, It's open, it's more accepting, um, but it's also more demanding in the sense that um, it it almost has a greater imperative towards authoritarianism um, because it it's semi-expansionist, and we'll talk more about expansionism in, in Islam later. But and that's why you see um, what had once been the persecution of of Christians, a sort of reversal as paganism after the adoption of the Roman Empire, uh, of Christianity in the Roman Empire, had not by far, by, by no means, completely died out. Uh, it persisted for quite some time. Uh, the pagans began to be persecuted. Now, this notion of chosenness continues uh, this, this into the Middle Ages, um, because what you get with the Semitic monolatrous, monotheistic religion is uh, a, a kind of authoritarian intolerance that just is implicit in the religion. Um, I have to be right if I'm believing this, and you, know, you have to be wrong, especially if you're a pagan or a polytheist. The monotheistic tendency towards authoritarianism and chosenness takes on its, its worst aspects, I would uh, argue, in the form of Islam, because Islam didn't even start off meekly. It started off an expansionist. Well, yes, of course, there are two periods, the, the Mecca period, but generally speaking, we're not talking about a, a hippie preacher who has violent mood swings every now and then, but a, a conqueror, a warrior, and one that asserted with absolute rectitude and certitude that his way was the only way or the way of Allah, whatever. Um, so the Mohammedan is, by his very nature, chosen. He's selected, elected, eh, to use a Latin term, believing in his own rectitude and righteousness and believing that everyone else is wrong. But not only that they're wrong, um, but that they should, if, if in being wrong, if they do not accept his truth, that they should be put uh, to the sword. So there's that inherent, very strong notion of chosenness but it's not an insular one. It's an expansionist notion of chosenness, which says, well, I'm right, and if you don't agree with me, I will do something about it. Now, of course, you can. Uh, this isn't purely black and white. I mean, there were expansionist periods of Christianity, obviously. But I think if you compare the course of history of Christianity, which is, which is different from, from the, the course of history with Islam, regards to Islam, uh, you'll see that it's... It, it, la it lacks the continuity of expansionism that Islam just seems to have across the board until they're, they're effectively stopped in, in many cases. In the case of uh, the expansion to Europe and France, or uh, Gaul at the time, by Charles Martel in 732, um, several battles, Poitiers, among others. But I mean, by its very nature, um, Islam is expansionist and chosen. I mean, the, the Muslim regards himself as a uh, sort of a chosen being. But this is, of course, different from the Jew who regards himself as chosen. I mean, there's no doubt that there's a kind of superciliousness and arrogance 
to the Jewish belief of chosenness, but it, it's not expansionist. And generally speaking, uh, it, it entailed, it's not, it doesn't entail that other, others, must, others might be regarded as inferior to the Jew, um, but they don't necessarily need to be conquered and incorporated. But the expansionist mind uh, requires an incorporation and conquest. And Christianity could be viewed and interpreted in this regard as kind of middle ground, not really. I mean, there are different stages of history, but a kind of in-between uh, post between um, these worldviews, uh, theistic views or theo theo theological views uh, with regards to things. Now, I also want to point out that um, as much as Christianity is regarded as a sort of European phenomenon, I mean, it's been in Europe for a long time, I mean, it's not really European. It's, uh, despite incorporating elements of the mystery uh, cults at the time, um, Indo-European culture, I think, had and had has been always much more incorporative and assimilative than uh, Semitic cultures, which is to say, you know, the Romans said, you know, as long as you're paying your taxes and joining the party, you know, call your gods whatever you want to call them, you know, come up and step up and just and, you know, feel free to worship whatever. Maybe your god uh, is the same god as my wine god, maybe not, but it's all good as long as you pay your dues to Caesar and, you know, don't uh, become a rabble-rouser. Um, and the flexibility that during the Völkerwanderung, the Germanic tribes, this is Völker, Völkerwanderung is a, a German reference, historical reference to this time period when the Germanic tribes in late antiquity were, were pushed ever further west, primarily by the Hunnic uh, influence, the, the Huns pushing in from Central Asia, um, who then later became incorporated into the Roman Empire and took on cultural aspects. Um, these Germanic tribes would then later, later settle places like Spain, although only temporarily. They were rejected by the Moors, uh, as well as Germany and, um, and other places. Or what would Germania, what would later become known as Germany, um, Holy Roman Empire uh, prior to modern Germany. Um, so these, uh, the Germanic tribes carried with them that Indo-European flexibility of belief um, that that I think is much more culturally characteristic of the Indo-European than the Semitic. Uh, Christianity has that. The, the way you can recognize Christianity uh, as essentially non-European and Semitic is by that notion of chosenness. It's a different sort of chosenness to the original Judaism, but it is uh, nonetheless that sense that if you accept this one religion, then you're part of the chosen. And it's probably a good thing to you know preach and proselytize to assure yourself of your own rectitude and correctness because, you know, God forbid you might be wrong. Um, this seems very much, well, very different from Indo-European culture, which was much more incorporative and had many different gods and really didn't, uh, wasn't nearly as, as exclusive and exclusionary as, as the so many Semitic religions were, uh, and also not really... Uh, not really monolatrist or monotheistic, uh, for that matter. So uh, you have this phenomenon uh, that Christianity took hold in, in Europe um, for nigh to millennia. And as we move forward in, in history uh, towards the present, because I'm offering a cultural explanation here, a religious cultural explanation for why Europeans have become so paralyzed and effectively lame ducks. There are other, obviously, as I said, there's always some genetic component to things. I'm not talking about that here, though. Um, why they become so paralyzed is, in fact, something that I guess Nietzsche did refer to. He referred to as the death of God. Because the Semitic religions, all of them, carry some notion of, of, of chosenness in them, it's in sort of inherent, in, in, in different ways in each one, giving, the giving up or the resignation of Christian doctrine and Christian faith, which is a phenomenon that's taking place across most of Western Europe, has been accompanied by a resignation of the sense of, of election or being chosen. That's what I'm arguing here. The Mohammedan or the Muslim, by way of contrast, uh, even the, the moderate, 
still believes his faith because he has this faith to to be uh, of a chosen nature, that he is chosen in his belief and his singular deity. Um, but you could argue that Christian culture's primary influence in this re regard was to create a kind of religious vigilance towards the outsider, uh, a kind of cultural unity that allowed Christians to combat the Mohammedans back in the day, but also the sense that, that they themselves were chosen and that the opposition, um, in this case the Mohammedans, was, uh, well, was, was in the wrong, frankly speaking. Without, with, letting, with letting go of that, whether it's in France or Germany or the United Kingdom or Scandinavia, there's not much left. Um, it's it, yes, it is related to the modern animization, but it, 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 there's something much greater than that. I think. Now, I'm not arguing here by any means. Everyone who knows me knows that I'm a pretty, pretty strong atheist. I don't believe in any of this stuff. Never have been religious, and probably never will be. But it's undeniable that that cultural element seemed to glue together much of European sentiment, both in terms of European conquests abroad, but also the maintenance and defense of Europe against alien powers. And with the disintegration of that belief uh, in this, in effectively monotheistic authoritarianism and, and chosenness, you end up with the situation we have today where all you can say is, well, the Mohammedans and the trucks of peace are crazy, you know, niggas be doing crazy shit, but I ain't got no reason to oppose it, basically. Bit ghetto speak there. Uh, that's kind of how you end up in that situation. Because saying, you know, you believe in democracy and, and you don't even say Western values, human values, doesn't really give you much in the sense of being chosen. Chosenness, as it had been originally defined by the Hebrews back in the day, is, is exclusionary and exclusive. And even if you go through the stages of these so-called great monotheisms, um, it's just an expanded definition of chosenness, as I said. You know, Christianity is more inclusive, and uh, Islam is more inclusive in the sense that, yeah, as long as you convert, you won't get your head chopped off. But without that, without that essential element of exclusion and chosenness, uh, which I think was largely a product of, of Semitic uh, religion, Christian religion, not Indo-European, which I think is, is, is much more of this sort of open, I'll let you do your own thing as long as you leave me be uh, way of thinking. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're going to get what you have today. There's no... I mean, there's no really good pressing reason uh, that you can offer to people that they feel compelled towards in opposition to Mohammedan or Islamic expansion. And the, the Muslim, by way of contrast, feels obviously empowered because he believes he is he's chosen in a sense because he's found his one true religion. And that, lords and ladies, is the essential problem with monotheism. Despite occasional uh, periods of intolerance uh, during polytheistic stages, Roman, uh, Romans and Greeks, polytheism by its very nature is just more tolerant um, and by its very nature less authoritarian than uh, even henotheism because by its definition uh, it's, it's, not, doesn't, it's not that way. And then Latin monolatrism and, and later on monotheism. But that authoritarian chosen monotheism also led to some pretty strong bulwarks against outside uh, forces. Um, the, at this stage, people, of course, they don't like this so-called Islamification. They don't like that mosques are popping up everywhere. They don't like the Islamic ghettos in France, the trucks of peace, but... I think for most people, in addition to the reasons I've cited in my previous video on sort of cheeseburgers a lot on television, saying that you just don't like something isn't enough pressing enough reason for you to vocally and actively oppose it. Right? It's just, well, I don't like it as long as they leave me alone. 
And that's also the problem with the expansion's chosenness as well in regards to Islam. I mean, they they don't they cannot leave you alone. Uh, they don't they don't want just to do their own thing. It's not in their nature culturally, religiously. So not much that can be done about that. Am I calling for the resurrection of Christianity? Well, no. I think that ship has sailed and I mean so much of Christianity is manifestly fatuous and not correct, but it did serve some important function, a uh, kind of awareness, a cross-cultural, that served a cross-cultural European identity, even though the religion itself is not European and, and almost certainly in its core uh, more Semitic than it is uh, European. But uh, a strange legacy, this monotheistic one is, and uh, sadly, we have to deal with the fallout uh, of all of this. I mean, one wonders when regarding history how all of this could have uh, come out differently had certain things not happened, had a certain tribe not emerged uh, millennia ago, had not the, the fiction of Jesus come to the fore and taken hold, uh, had would there have been a Muhammad in his... Uh, conquering religion possibly not but um yeah and, and this is a real issue because people people just don't feel for lack of a better uh, phrase ideologically empowered enough to oppose uh, islam i mean chanting mu democracy and, and mu multiculturalism well, mu multiculturalism is part of the, the problem but certainly mu democracy and mu values well, that's, that's just not sufficient. There's no real unifying uh, principle there. Um, I think Europe has lost that in, in re resigning themselves uh, and giving up on, on Christianity, which, as I said, is in so many ways manifestly false and fatuous, but did serve an important function. Now, I, for one, I think it's possible to be opposed to Islam or really any of these so-called great monotheisms, for reasons that have nothing to do with the ideological or the theological. I mean, I don't, to feel opposition, particularly towards Islam, but against any, towards any of these things, all I need to know is that they are, they're not working with facts and they're not data-driven. That's enough for me. So to create a worldview or a, a world that's not based on data, but rather fanciful con con uh, conceit and imagination is not a world I want to live in, particularly when the conceit uh, demands that I bow down to it or the, the people who are proffering this conceit. I have no interest in that. But I suppose you could argue that in my case, being interested in understanding the world as best as I can and promoting, if you will, an ideology of of, I guess, scientific rationality, although I, I, I really wouldn't call it an ideology, but still, promoting that view, you know, you just have to be opposed to this sort of stuff. It's the same, same reason I'm opposed to democracy. I don't think democracy is a very good system of governance. It's led to the mess we have now. And um, But for your average person, your normie, who has neither a nuanced view nor any view, for that matter, of these things, Yes, it, it, it's difficult to come up with a reason to oppose this stuff other than, you know, every time a truck of peace crashes into a mall, maybe, well, oh, God, there goes, there goes my shopping spree. There goes my day. Oh, boy, stressful. The trucks of peace, I think, obviously are much more symbolic than they are a real danger. It's, you're much more likely to get struck by lightning, I, I think, still at this stage of the game. But... Um, People need reasons to oppose things, and Europeans, by and large, have lost their reasons for many, mostly for the, I think, uh, my interpretation of things, for the reasons I cited, um, but also because they just have no, they have no worldview whatsoever, the, or a very vague one that, that's poorly defined and differentiated. And I think... Well, obviously, I'm going to argue that my my view is probably the more correct one, which is to say, 
you know, go by the data. And where there's where there's not enough data, then you know we will have to shrug our shoulders and say, well, we don't we we don't know, or there um, the data just aren't there. But we know that Islam is not beneficial towards uh, for the scientific uh, the scientific worldview. Uh, it's not beneficial to advancing technology and, and human civilization. So there, there are some really good reasons right there to oppose it. Um, I mean, never mind its absolute uh, fas- uh, fatuousness and, and falsity. But uh, yeah, so I think I've kind of covered most of the ground here as to why I, I, I think that, well, historically monotheism, I think we Europeans really got some bad luck with that. Um, because it's kind of really been a mixed blessing. But um, at this stage of the game, the utilitarian aspect of Christianity as a kind of bulwark of of unity, of self-identified chosenness in opposition to another self-identified chosenness is, um, yeah, I mean, uh, what's there left to say? It's just not there. And people need reasons to oppose things. Now, Lacking that, I mean, I think most people crave some, I'm a freak. I don't need some concrete sense of identity. I think identity, if you break it down scientifically, is nonsense, if only because of the haphazard nature of reality. We're not authors of ourselves. But I think most, the common person, and even the uncommon person, requires some sense of identity. It's why you see the anti-SJWs calling themselves you know, free thinkers and libertarians. And it accounts for the existence of the alt-right and white nationalism and even the alt-light. Um, however, too few of these uh, movements have the vehemence of conviction in their kind of chosenness. Most of, if you look, look at the alt-right, most of the alt-right's arguments are emotional. Um, I um, recently listened to a podcast between a Romy Millennial who is a very unremarkable but pretty uh, half Chinese, half white girl who has lots of subs because she looks good, um, and Greg Johnson and Millennial Woes. And Greg Johnson occasionally offered some tidbits of science, but mostly it was just it was emotional, the, the way he was arguing. Um, and which is not to say that M- Romy and Millennial was, was, was countering him particularly well. She, had, she was all over the map, and her knowledge of genetics is paltry, and, and I think almost non-existent, so she couldn't really counter some of his arguments. But nonetheless, um, the emotional and power is a person like him, and, and so the, there's a sense, a greater sense of, of momentum, whereas the sort of you know, free market or libertarian or whatever, that's, it's hard to, few people don't feel empowered enough to do something with that, um, which is you know, why you're seeing the rise of, of the alt-right and I think uh, white, white nationalism or however you want to term it. But yeah, I mean, this is a real predicament uh, for all the reasons I've cited. I have no illusion, and I'm not suffering under the delusion that my worldview of sort of tr- the transhumanist technocracy is, would be sufficient for most people to oppose forces like Islam or what have you. Far more likely is the case of falling into some sort of identitarian politics. Um, which is which would be supported by the historical record. I mean, this is across the board the case. Uh, I don't think this is a good thing, mind you, but it does seem to be human nature. Uh, most people are just stuck with this. And, uh, yeah. In any event, I think I've covered uh, most of the ground I wanted to cover. A bit of a long video, but uh, once again, I am not known for being pithy and, and brief, so my apologies although most of my long-term subs know to appreciate that aspect about me. So everyone, thanks for tuning in. And uh, no pun intended this time, may your chosen deity watch over you. Hopefully it is one amongst many. Hopefully you are a polytheist and perhaps a henotheist, but no monotheist and no monolatrist. And I will check you out later. Bye-bye. If you liked this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.